I also think it's just understanding your area and maybe the needs of the hospitals, medical examiners, whatever that looks like in your area. You know, if the medical examiners don't do their own removals and they need to rely on funeral homes for removals, is there a rotation that you can get on? Can you start with that rotation and start just doing some removals? And then if you end up doing that and that decedent is already in your care because you've done the removal on behalf of the medical examiner staff, that family is not tied to using you, but they're a lot more likely to because their loved one's already in your care. Those types of things where you're understanding how things work in your area. And I understand like that example doesn't apply everywhere, but it's an idea of just understanding the area around you. You know, how are the hospitals handling deaths? Do they all have morgues? Do they need overflow space? Like, What are all those things that you can tap into by understanding the area and what the needs of the area are and how you can help? Welcome to the Direct Cremation Podcast with your hosts, Tyler Yamasaki and Will DeMichaelis. Hi, thank you for joining us on the Direct Cremation Podcast. I'm your host, Tyler Yamasaki, CEO of Parting Pro. And as always, I'm here with my co-host, Will DeMichaelis funeral home consultant to the stars and former manager of the Omega Society, a cremation brand that served over 4,500 families per year. If you like the content, please give us a like, subscribe, comment below. So today is the obvious second chapter uh, to the last episode where we talked about the biggest mistakes cremation brands are making today. And today we have Ashley Jones and Will, who together were managing two cremation businesses that we're serving over 10,000 families per year. So today what we're going to do is we're going to talk about if we were to build a cremation brand from scratch, what are the elements and things that we would focus on to get that started and to grow that into a successful cremation brand. So welcome, Ashley. Welcome, Will. Thank you. Thank you. Great to be here as always. Yeah. And nice to meet you, Ashley. I don't think we've ever spoken formally, but I've heard a lot about you. Awesome. Yeah. Great to meet you too. Yeah. At one time, I think you guys were both managing probably two of the top five largest cremation brands in the the United States, which would probably be close to the world. So you guys were doing quite a bit. So today, like I said, what we'll do today is we'll imagine that, you know, we had maybe some of the resources, we had access to a funeral license and a crematory, and we needed to now create cremation society abc from scratch where would we start well i think the right demographic location is a thing to think about right because if you're a smaller town but you're near you know a bigger city that has a bigger population and you're thinking about where you're going to serve you want to take those things into consideration and what's your range going to be is the demographic you're looking to serve is the volume going to be there like what knowledge do we have about the area that we can take into the business and kind of have those markers that it's got some good, that's what I'm looking for. It's got some good factors that it will be successful given that you've got that kind of volume to pull from. Yeah, I think I completely agree, Ashley. I think that really leaves like medium to larger size metro areas as probably the only viable options. So yeah, you're going to be in a larger metro area to serve. Yeah, it's amazing that people can have a good business, but they just choose the wrong place. And it just doesn't, you know, you're just capped by where you are. I think after a good geographical location, you're going to want to concentrate on a digital experience and your perceived value online. Mm -hmm. So that's a lot of great digital experience, which means good graphics on your website, easy to navigate website, an online arranger where everyone can price out all of your services without the help of a phone call if needed. Well, I guess it should be possible and seamless without a phone call. And you can be available for phone calls if needed. But for everything to make sense to an 80 year old that's never visited your website, if they can get through an online arrangement and do it with relative ease, then I think that's a great barometer of a good digital experience. Yeah. Maybe not 80, maybe a little younger, but yeah. (laughs) I would agree with you, but I I would say that it would start even earlier, right? We would have to go and make sure that our Google listing page looks good. Yes. Before they even make it to your website, you want to make sure that if you are going to do Facebook or any of those that you have a presence 
that you've mm-hmm. created those and taken ownership of all those accounts, whether it's Yelp. Because basically, if you don't put that stuff out there, someone mm-hmm. else can come in and create a Yelp page for you. And most of the right. time, people putting information online, they're not going to do it because they're super happy. Right. So if you can mm-hmm. control that narrative, put that out there, claim or create your Google business page, claim or create your Facebook page or Yelp page, become the owner of all those, put the messaging that you want to put out there, make it so that it looks like that you are a business, you're a person, make sure that you look like you've been in business or at least know what you're doing so that if someone does find you in any of these channels, they get the same consistent feeling from you, that trustworthy feeling. Mm-hmm. I think that's where it starts. Yeah, that's a good call, Tyler. Yeah, that's a really good point. I think yeah. it's also understanding what your competitor's digital presence is and seeing, you know, if there are obvious gaps that you can fill or where you can stand out, especially if you're in those larger metro areas, there's bound to be multiple competitors. And so it's, I think, finding your kind of niche in that area and trying to Excel and looking at it as a total experience from start to finish rather than segmented. And well, my website's great, but if you don't have all of the other things, like you were mentioning, Tyler, like the Yelp page, like the Google page, it's not truly an experience because that customer gets to your website. Maybe they even do an arrangement, but you're lacking the follow up review, which again just turns it leads to the whole experience because that's going to help you get the next customer. You just have to look at the whole cycle of the experience versus can they do like an online arrangement? Do I have a website? It's really putting the customer first and putting the customer experience first. I think a lot of times, and I'm guilty of this too, I've developed something as a funeral director and without knowing it, I created a process or used language that is more industry jargon, which didn't have the customer in mind. And kind of having the presence of mind to maybe enlist help of someone of a Mm -hmm. potential customer to really understand how they read the words on a page or how they navigate things on your, your business page. Or if things don't match on your Yelp and Facebook page, what does that tell them? Or do they say, Hey, I'm not sure that this is legit. And then they're done interacting with you overall. Mm -hmm. And in that case, you've shot yourself in the foot. A great digital experience from the customer's point of view, not from your business point of view, I think is huge. Mm -hmm. Really trying to get in the mind of a customer and how they make decisions and what language is clearest to them that makes them actually finish an online arrangement rather than get 80% through and not finish. That happens more often than not is people don't finish those online arrangements and you want to bring them into the process to help yourself really find the path of least resistance to completion for your customers. I think that's a good distinction to make because I think when we get, especially when we're working in the industry and you're talking to your coworkers all day about things or other people that are in the field, we use these kind of terms and like witness cremation is a good example of that. If you put a question in your online arranger is, would you like a witness cremation? Not everybody necessarily knows what that means. And that can lead to a whole lot of like, maybe images about what you think that is as the consumer. And if you've never heard of that before, and it's not something, you know, in your culture or that you've done, just phrasing that a different way is still giving the customer the knowledge of the question that you're asking, but just phrasing it in non-funeral speak goes a long way. It leads to maybe less questions, all of those things. So yes, from the consumer's point of view is key for sure. I think that's a really good example, actually, that where you say witness cremation and going the extra mile of adding two sentences of defining what that means for your business specifically, Mm -hmm. it alleviates future questions about it and provides transparency in that moment to the family. And that's huge. It's very, very frequent that People think a witness cremation is coming, watching the insertion of the body into the retort or into the chamber, and then staying for the duration. Mm -hmm. And that's a really big mismanagement of expectations versus the reality that can unnecessarily create a bad experience. So I think that's a great point in providing definitions for what 
these services are to your business as part of their experience. Yeah. I think one of the things that you said, Will, that was really good is you have to think about it from the customer's side. Even at Parting Pro, and Ashley, I'm sure you agree with this, is we are introducing technology to businesses that maybe aren't as used to using technology. So we do things in a way that we think should be done, or we use terms that we understand what they mean, and they make it good for us, but that doesn't necessarily make it good for the customer, right? Mm -hmm. Like You can do all of this work, and that's what we need. But I think a lot of times what we found to be a really big advantage is if you can take yourself out of that and actually run through the experience yourself as a consumer, you'll probably find some things that feel not so great. Yeah. Or feel that, okay, we could probably make this different where maybe it's a little bit more work on my end, but it makes the Mm -hmm. overall experience so much better for the family, for the consumer, for the buyer, that it would make sense for us to have to change it that way. Right. Yeah. I completely agree. I think a lot of what a counselor does is education and teaching and not every student knows the same, has the same vocabulary or learns in the same way. So as a director or arrangement counselor, it's up to you to find the best words to communicate what things mean and where their expectations should be, especially high volumes. And you're helping, you know, three or four Mm -hmm. different families a day. It can Mm -hmm. get rote, unfortunately. And you got to be mindful of that. Were there any examples either of you can think of where you had created or developed a process And you thought, wow, this is really good. And you were thinking about it more from your end. And then you realized that once you introduced it, or once you kind of found that once the family had to go through it, it wasn't affecting the same way. We had a process where every day we would call the families to let them know that their loved ones cremated remains were ready to be returned and brought home. And in our process, that is cremains ready for pickup. And that's the shorthand that we wrote in our process when we're doing our daily meeting. Like these were cremated yesterday. So today that becomes the list of remains that are eligible to, to be picked up. So in our mind, pickup is fine because that's the language we've used in our daily meetings for years. We've never thought about it twice because it's all internal and we never thought about it from the customer's perspective. But when we call those families and we use that same language, they may say, because it's our fault, I'm not picking up a UPS package. It's my dad. Mm -hmm. So Mm -hmm. that's something where, oh, we were thinking about our internal jargon that we used regularly. And when we kind of switched the process for the customer, we took that language and it's not the best language for the customer. So we needed to change that and say, your loved one's remains are ready to go home with you or ready to set an appointment for you to take your loved one back into your care. So Mm -hmm. that was not malicious. It was just an oversight. And if you don't think about it, the customer will remind you to think about it. Mm -hmm. Let's put it that way, right? Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah. And I agree. I think most of the things like this that any funeral home does, you know, I never see them as malicious. I think it's just that next level of understanding. And one thing that I think of is, you know, we used to offer a rush cremation. And so that was a question that got put in the online arranger, you know, would you like a rush cremation? I can't remember exactly the way it was phrased, but we were just finding that that was too confusing, that we were getting too many questions or the expectations that the family had was that, as soon as they were done with that arrangement, basically they could kind of walk in the next day and pick and yeah. say, I just yeah. picked up is what we say yeah. and receive their loved ones cremated remains, but it just wasn't the fact. So we just needed to kind of clarify that once we were seeing, okay, this isn't being understood the way that we thought it would be understood probably because it's just to us. It's, it's what we say. It's the normal kind of thing, but we just needed to add in some more, you know, details around that to give more context to the customer so that they could complete that without having questions or misunderstandings at the end of it. That's a great example, actually, because we had families that knew nothing about a rush, Mm -hmm. but as they saw that their loved one was transported from the hospital, 
So they waited one hour and then came <sighs> to our facility in an hour and say, Hey, yeah, my dad was transported here an hour ago. I'm here for the cremated remains. Yeah. And that's it's just simply that they don't know that the yeah. health department's yeah. involved, that documentation mm-hmm. has to be filed. And we hadn't even gotten a chance to reach out to them to explain a process. They yeah. had formulated the process in their mind mm-hmm. and were just acting as if they knew it as mm-hmm. gospel. And that happens a lot. That happens a lot. Definitely. Yeah. You get used to kind of managing those experiences for mm-hmm. folks. And it's usually that they're not even thinking because they're grief stricken. Mm-hmm. So yeah, you have to explain it very, you know, nicely to them. And everyone understands once you explain it, but it's just getting that yeah. opportunity before they get ahead of themselves mm-hmm. sometimes. too. Yeah. So yeah. yeah, I think a good tip for anybody that's starting the online arrangement process as a funeral home or funeral director is have your friend or your loved one, your spouse, whoever, go through that online arranger as if they know nothing and see what questions mm-hmm. are left for them and do it with a few mm-hmm. people because everybody's going to understand it a little bit differently. But it should give you a pretty good baseline of, does this communicate what I think it's communicating? Right. right. Yeah. So I have to give a shout out to my mom because when we first created the online arranger, we actually had my mom go through through it a bunch of times. She's not Mm -hmm. particularly tech savvy or, you know, into the funeral industry or the profession whatsoever. And just kind of listen to that feedback so that it's clear, not only for someone who's maybe not super techie, but also Mm -hmm. who doesn't know funeral jargon. And so having that like third party perspective of someone who's has really no reason to lie to you, no reason to like... Mm -hmm understand and have context around things that most people aren't going to have context around, I think was really helpful. Yeah. Really that process is getting someone with fresh eyes to ask the dumb questions that you haven't thought of. Mm -hmm. And they're not dumb questions. It's just like, what does this mean? What does this mean? And that just tells you what they're seeing and how they're reading your language, which is hugely helpful. I found usually after doing that, even just three or four times, you make you know, 90% of the changes that get you Mm -hmm. to where you want to go. Yeah, I think that's good. And I think that can stem from anywhere. It can stem from the online arranger. It can stem from just analyzing your website. It could stem from just, hey, Google me or try to find me online. Just having your friend try to find you, Mm -hmm. compare you to all the other competitors in that area Mm -hmm. and giving you feedback on every step of the way, how they felt, what it seemed like. It seems like you don't do business. It seems like you are so new that I don't know if I would trust you. Like, yeah. I think being able to yeah. take that type of feedback and applying it and doing that can be immensely helpful mm-hmm. to creating a better experience. And this is before you even get into the other stuff that we're going to get into. <laughs> okay. So I think just having a great digital experience, right? We realize that we're probably not going to need the best in-person experience anymore, especially for creating an online brand. But let's move on to price. Now, I know that there is no specific price that I have to say or that you should be at. I also know that we consistently have said that being the lowest is not necessarily where you need to be. Yeah. But the way I describe it is you have to have a justifiably attractive price. Mm -hmm. And obviously those aren't hard numbers, but I'd say that you have to be able to justify the value that you're providing. And if you can't do it for close to what your competitors are going to be doing on the lower end, then maybe it just isn't, you know, something that you should be doing. Yeah. Mm -hmm. I think what Ashley started with, with location really dictates where your price is going to settle at depending on the metro area where you choose it's Mm -hmm. different on the east coast versus midwest versus west and they all have their different models and where kind of that tier of acceptably justifiable prices is and i think your digital experience can help justify the perception of that price too i mean a justifiably attractive price, I think, is a good way to put it. And that can be a pretty big range, some anywhere between, you know, eight hundred to fifteen hundred dollars or mm-hmm. sixteen, eight to seventeen hundred dollars. Below the national average of like twenty two hundred, 
definitely, but really not the mm-hmm. lowest price possible. Uh, yeah, I'd say as a general rule of thumb, under fifteen percent. Uh, if you were to rank all the direct commissions like in your area, you want to be in the bottom fifteen percent of price. Yeah, that'd be a good way to figure it out. Obviously, that can change and range from different locales. One thing that I, I do want to mention, though, as we talk about demographic, and what we've seen is that. Even Omega Society at your peak and Crown at your peaks, you guys were probably the majority brands in your areas, but there were still a ton of other cases that were going to other people, right? Mm -hmm. And I think what we see is that a lot of people see a lot of competition and they think, oh, you know, I can't compete here or there's already too many competitors. But the reason that there is is because there are so many deaths in that area. Like Los Angeles, Mm -hmm. for example, the Los Angeles County and Orange County, which kind of all serve the same market, there's so many cases going around that you can yeah. be a negligible percentage of that market yeah. share and still do 10, 20, 30, 40 cases a month. And yeah. that's a good business as someone who's just doing it as your own business, mm-hmm. right? Maybe yeah. on the yeah. maybe on the whole spectrum of market share, you're not you're just a small blip on that, but that's still a, a considerable amount of people in an area that can support that. Yeah. Yeah. There are uh, only a few areas in the US that have that luxury. And yeah, Southern mm-hmm. California is definitely one of them. California in general yeah. is one of them. Yeah. I mean, California, Florida. Yeah. I think Washington is a big one too. Yeah. Texas. Yeah. Like a lot yeah. of these. Or if you're just around a major city, yeah. you know, any of the major cities that have two, three, four, five hundred thousand 500,000 plus people in that area, you're going to be able to do it. Otherwise, mm-hmm. I think what you have to do is you have to serve like a very wide range of people, right? So you have to serve like the entire state, which mm-hmm. then cuts into, you know, all kinds of other things. It's a more of a logistical thing that you have to figure out, but that's kind of what you're going to be looking at. Yeah. And I think it just also just depends on the goal of the company, right? If it's, you know, one person trying to start up a business and their goal is to be able to sustain that business to support themselves and that's a different goal than starting a side brand of a traditional funeral home where you've got a massive staff that you have to consider and support and do all those things. So the pull is different, right? It's like, what do you reasonably need to sustain? And that's going to also dictate your price. I agree that it doesn't have to be the lowest for sure. I just think it needs to be in a ballpark where people will consider you, right? Because if people are shopping online and they can see two or three prices from eight ninety five to twelve ninety five and you're at twenty two ninety five, well, they're probably not gonna call you. <laughs> They've got four other options that are far less than you that they could consider and all those things that you just said, if you're in a bigger city, there's not really a reason to at that point. You've got multiple options. So I think it's just understanding what the goal is. Are you trying to become the biggest provider in that area or are you trying to, you know, have a reasonable amount of business to sustain a career? So, okay. So let's see. Okay. So let's go through it so far. We've solidified our online presence. You know, we went to everywhere we could go and made our profiles, taken nice pictures and gotten our messaging down. We made our new website. We have an online arranger. We did all that. We've created our pricing to be competitive but also at a price that we can justify the value. So now we're going to kind of create the standard operating procedures to make it so that we can justify that low cost price. So where do we start in creating this efficient business model? Yeah, so... So I guess like, let's start here. I think that one, you have to have a growth plan. Right. And the growth plan has to involve... So basically, you know, if you think about it, when we talk about funnels and sales funnels and stuff like that, you have to have phone calls, you have to have website visitors, you have to start generating that. If you don't already have some type of, you know, we do have customers that sometimes start a side online brand. The only reason they're doing that is because they have so many price shoppers to their full service, expensive brand, and they're losing those to competitors. So now they have this way of getting calls and then now maybe converting those people who would have gone to a competitor to themselves, right? And they have an option. But what you can't do is start a brand and just be like, okay, my website's up, we're ready to go. Like that's just not gonna happen. Yeah, it's not one of those things, if you build it, they will come. You have to get out in the streets. We've talked about this, I think, ad nauseum, Tyler, like getting cases for the least expensive 
acquisition mm-hmm. costs. Starting a digital cremation company, I think you know that you're going to have to have significant ad spend online to generate business. And whatever your budget is for that, account for that. We've talked about how those costs have been increasing, probably about $200 to acquire a customer online, maybe a little more, maybe a little less. Aside from that, I think the biggest thing that someone could do is hospice marketing. And if you really want to make it easy for yourself, create some educational materials to help hospice workers do their job better, educate them about advanced directives in a flyer, educate them about the difference between DNRs and advanced directives or the health and safety code in your state and the order of next of kin. Because you'd be surprised at how many of those social workers and nurses actually haven't been educated on those things. And they're eager and thirsty to absorb those things. And one idea that I have, which would be, I think would be very useful for folks that I've seen other places do is on those flyers, have a QR code Mm -hmm. that goes directly to your registration of an imminent need on a parting prep. So give them access to register their patients at your company free of charge and develop that as a pipeline because those hospice cases will turn into at needs more likely than not within three weeks. So you're actually helping your existing business and not relying on pre-needs, but it's this happy sweet spot where hospice can really help in addition to your digital ad spend to get ad needs from Google and, you know, wherever you're doing paid channels like Yelp and such. So Mm -hmm. that's how I would kind of do paid versus non-paid channels to get Mm -hmm. started. Yeah, I also think it's just understanding your area and maybe the needs of the hospitals, medical examiners, whatever that looks like in your area. You know, if the medical examiners don't do their own removals and they need to rely on funeral homes for removals, is there a rotation that you can get on? Can you, you know, start with that rotation and start just doing some removals? And then if you end up doing that and that decedent is already in your care because you've done the removal on behalf of the medical examiner staff, that family is not tied to using you, but they're a lot more likely to because their loved one's already in your care. So like those types of things where you're understanding how things work in your area. And I understand like that example doesn't apply everywhere, but it's an idea of just understanding the area around you. You know, how are the hospitals handling deaths? Do they all have morgues? Do they need overflow space? Like, yeah. what are all yeah. those things that you can tap into by understanding mm-hmm. the area and what the needs of the area are and how you can help? In this, Tyler, I think maybe we skipped a big step is if we had an online cremation brand that do they have our own storage or are we subcontracting space? From another funeral home and what about our retorts too mm-hmm. that's true that's what may be a differentiator i think that's going to differentiate between a lot i think people are going to share resources i think we're going to have that yeah. i mean i think that yeah that can be a whole nother i think that's important because actually what you thought of is brilliant you know getting on those rotations calling the hospitals and saying hey i'm available for overflow if you have mm-hmm. fridge space mm-hmm. that you purchased mm-hmm. that is a great way to get families to interact with you. Mm -hmm. And if you have a good experience Mm -hmm. from the first touch point, then more often than not, Mm -hmm. that family will want their loved one to stay with you. You build trust quickly. So that's huge. Yeah, I think the biggest thing that I would take away from this part is just making sure that you have some type of plan, right? Mm -hmm. You need to figure out how you're going to go from your first zero to 10 cases per month. Yeah. Right. That could be paid. It could be all on Google. But I would also look at making sure that even if you are going to do paid, that you're spending it in the right channels, right? Yeah. There are mm-hmm. long-term plays. There are short-term plays. There's at need. There's pre-need. And every type of digital marketing platform is going to be centered around different types of cases, right? We've mm-hmm. always kind of said Google is your at need. Facebook and social is a little bit more on the pre-need side. To your point, I think hospice is something that you need to get on from day one, but you're probably not going to reap those benefits for the first couple months, right? You may get them right away, but it takes time to build that up, to build up the trust with the social workers who have heard of you, who have had families use you that can mention you in passing to their social worker so that they feel confident in 
quote unquote recommending you or at least putting you in the conversation of choices, right? But that's going to take some time. So if you're not in a hurry to get cases in that first month, then maybe you can just go all in on the hospice side, yeah, the referral side. But I would also look at, this is where I would say you do kind of want to look at competitors, see what they're doing, see if there's ways that you can provide value over them, because that's going to tell a lot about your market as well, right? If no one on your in your market is going online and looking on Google, then that's probably not where you need to spend your money. If everyone's doing billboards, then a billboard might be a reasonable choice and i we have seen billboards work in certain locations i don't know about like la but maybe in a little bit more rural but still has a decent population those have worked right so Mm -hmm. i think that you have to have some type of growth plan right there needs to be an idea of okay i think i can get my first 10 cases from this and then i could go from 10 to 20 from this and then eventually you know hospice will kick in then the work that i've been doing there will start to grow us from 20 to 40 and maybe I'm happy at 40 or maybe I need to think about beyond that. But I think there definitely needs to be some type of growth plan involved on where you're going to get your first 10, 20, 30, 40 cases. Yeah, and I just yeah. see it as like having some tools in your tool belt, right? Like doing some initial research and understanding on what those things can be that are going to help you, you know, if you do hit a roadblock here or there, like what else can you pull on? That I think is probably the biggest takeaway from efficient business model and where you get cases is I think a lot of folks, like we're a digital brand, we're getting our cases from digital mediums. Mm -hmm. And I don't think that you need to do that. I think that there's so much like that one person can do out in the field, like visiting the right facilities and getting in touch with the right people that can make huge impacts to your business. Because these people are dealing with death and dying every single day and establishing a good rapport with them can explode your business. Mm -hmm. When they like you, if one social worker refers a family and they rave about you, if that social worker will make sure that you're one of the few mortuaries that each of their families calls to see if they're a good fit. That's what I kind of call like on Google, you have a three pack those top three results at the top of your Google search, social workers do the same thing for their clients. Mm -hmm. They have a list of 15 funeral homes, but they probably Mm -hmm. have asterisks or highlights next to Mm -hmm. the top three that they definitely want you to call. And you want to be one of those three. Mm -hmm. Yeah, agreed. 100%. And they deal with death and dying exclusively. There's no other business that deals exclusively with death and dying or the terminally ill, like hospice. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Yeah, for sure. Yeah. Okay. So I think depending on your location, depending on your market, you're going to have different channels. Me mm-hmm. personally, I would start with probably PPC, which is Google, build up my cases, get there, get some word of mouth, get some reviews, and then that will kind of snowball into being able to do some more of the other stuff, word of mouth. My local SEO will grow, stuff like that. Okay. So now let's move into. The actual business itself. We've now figured out a way to get phone calls. Our phone is starting to ring. Mm-hmm. What now? What is the next step in something that we have to make sure that we're doing correctly to make sure that our business is going to succeed? Answer every phone call. Don't let it go to voicemail. I think this is where something that Will that you said earlier, having that like family at the center of the mind at all times that it's they're going through an experience, they have a question, it might be the same question that you've answered five times today. But it doesn't really matter, because it's this family's first question, and it's their first experience with that. So I think you need staff that can really grasp onto that and answer those questions kindly, give them guidance, and really keep that at the front of their mind. Because especially when you are doing high volume, things can get a little rope, it can get a little routine. It can get, I'm answering the same thing. My tone of voice is saying the same. Like there's no, you know, level of service within that phone call. And like, this is one of the biggest things is going to set a funeral home apart. Because if you are like, we'll just said in that top three, and you've got a family calling three funeral homes, that phone call is going to tip the scale. I guarantee you. Yeah. hundred percent. Even if they are several hundred dollars more, if that family has a good experience on the phone, they feel understood they feel like this person makes them comfortable. They could talk to this person. They would like basically their loved one to be in their care because of this phone call. 
it's going to tip the scale every time. I just, it's hard to see a way around it. We've seen it thousands of times every year. I know that when a customer calls me and they've called one of our competitors before, the person who establishes the credibility and trust with that family the fastest will get the case. Mm -hmm. And if you do that on your call, better than the person that they've talked to before, and they will not call the third place. Mm -hmm. They'll say, well, I want you to help us. What do we need to do? Let's get started. Mm -hmm. And as an arranger or funeral director, if you can do that, then you've done your job, right? Exactly. Yeah. 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 And you'd be amazed. I mean, it's, you develop tactics to make sure that you're good at that, but you're right. Keeping everything fresh, understanding that every call is a new family that's going through the worst day of their year and, and or life. And if you can always keep that mindset fresh and mm-hmm. make them feel that, what you said, Ashley, is huge. Make them feel understood. Mm-hmm. So one of the things that I learned is part of healing is being understood. So if they're talking to you and you're reverberating back what they're giving you and they say, okay, this person understands where I'm coming from, Mm -hmm. in their mind, your credibility and trustworthiness is increasing. They don't want to start a new relationship where they have to rebuild that with someone. If you Mm -hmm. can do that and show them that very quickly, they don't want to go anywhere else. Mm -hmm. And they'll tell you, okay, what do I need to do? Here's my name. Here's my father's name. And you're Mm -hmm. going. Yeah. Yeah. I think what this speaks to what's behind this actually is like team alignment, like having the, your staff aligned on what the goal is, what should happen at each point so that there's, you know, no questions along the way. There's a built in process for the way that things are handled your staff can trust that process. You can trust that process. Therefore, your families can trust that process. They don't know there's a process, but you know what I mean? Like there's that feeling of trust that can be built there because the person on the phone is confident about what's happening and can relay that to the it's family. Amazing. It's amazing. Even just having things like ask who you're speaking with, refer to them by name, ask who they're making arrangements for, what's the situation, getting your bearings on the situation. Yeah expressing your condolences when you know a death has occurred. Sometimes new counselors or new funeral directors, they'll get five minutes into a conversation asking questions about pricing, and then they don't know the name of the loved one because they didn't ask at the front end, and they don't Mm -hmm. know if the person's passed away. Mm -hmm. And it just makes for a weird conversation if you ask that in the middle rather than at the beginning. Mm -hmm. You know, simple things like that. Mm -hmm. You're trying to do the right thing, but it end up the conversation doesn't go how it should. Yeah. It can't feel transactional. What's your price for a direct cremation? It's this. All right. Well, that's the end of the conversation. (laughs) If that's what you needed it to be, you know, if they just wanted a price, no, there needs to be something else there that you can, you know, start that conversation, start a relationship and it not be simply transactional. This is also in regards to phones. Like I am a big proponent is if you can figure out how to get somebody to answer your phones, even overnight, you are going to be in a much better situation. So if you can have a person that's attached to your business, they don't even need to be one of your daytime staff people who knows the ins and outs and everything, but they are a live person who can answer your phones with empathy, with compassion, answer some of those questions, at the very least, ensure them that there is competent staff that will be able to call you back and, and answer this question for you if they can't. I just think it's a game changer if you can do that. I I credit a lot of our success and real growth to having a knowledgeable person and live person answer our phones overnight for the entirety of our business with no answering service. Yeah. If I'm in a market where my two biggest competitors use answering services and I use a real live person that knows our GPL Mm -hmm. and our software would be a plus, we own the nights, as they say, mm-hmm. <laughs> you know, you yeah. know, it's so much better. So much better. It's true. I do want to say that I recognize that this is one of those things that is fair and unfair as someone who's running a funeral business, right? We're telling you, you have to be on call 24 seven, which we talk about work-life balance. We talk about people that are hiring new grads out of mortuary school and stuff. That's not fair, but you know, if you're asking how, (laughs) 
to create this business that is something that I think is undeniably going to be important to your business. And whoever can figure that out is going to win a lot more than not. Mm -hmm. So yeah. I recognize that it's hard and it's yeah. maybe unrealistic sometimes to answer 100% of your phones every single time, but the effort mm -hmm. should be there to try to make sure. Can you imagine, yeah. right? Someone dies in your family and you call and you get a voicemail. Like, how does that feel for your first experience? Right. Right. Mm -hmm. right. Will I call this person back unless I really yeah. need to, or will I go to the next person who answers my call right away? Right. That's just a huge one. Mm hmm. Agreed. I would almost rather get a voicemail than an answering service, though, for some reason, depending on, I don't know, I just heard some pretty yeah, bad answering services. Are answering, very services. Tough. Yeah. answering services, in my experience, are pretty useless overnight. Usually, mm -hmm. if it's a death call, they have to get a, they're taking a voicemail and texting a director a yeah. lot of the time anyway. And they're just mm -hmm. a middleman. Yeah. And if they're not doing that, they're telling people to call back in the morning anyway. Unfortunately, it's not that useful of a service, in my opinion. Yeah. And any of my families that I handled, I would just tell them when I'd be back in the office in the morning, and then sure. they can call me with any questions they have overnight mm -hmm. then. We had a live person, and I, I had confidence in them, but we have an answering service. They're not really it's getting large. much answered overnight. No. Yeah. A lot of funeral homes are losing cases overnight because of answering mm -hmm. services. I can yeah. say that with a lot of confidence yeah and i think too like i understand the predicament right like a funeral director is already somewhat on call i just think we need to tap into resources that we might be able to use outside of an answering service and maybe even outside of your daytime staff so is there somebody that could answer your phones overnight we have i think of a couple of you know clients that use college age kids or people that are going to college to be able to do this at some level where they get a little bit of training, they understand the need for it, and they're willing to do it overnight, or maybe it's even up into the evenings up into a certain hour or something like that, but you still get that live person. I think that's a good, good answer. I think even less expensive would be going on a freelance platform like Upwork oh, or sure. Fiverr. Mm -hmm. And hiring a customer service representative from a less expensive mm -hmm. part of the U.S. or even oh, overseas. Sure. And they'll do calls much less expensively than even the most least expensive American worker. They might even have a college degree or a master's degree in the Philippines mm -hmm. and with no accent. I mean, it's a lot of other industries use customer support internationally, and it hasn't come to this industry but I think it's worth suggesting. To bring it back, I think that the reason that we are stressing so much on having to answer the phone is because we want to create an efficient business, right? And efficiency means that for every 100 phone calls we get, right? Every time the phone rings 100 times from, let's say, a price shopper or someone asking about information, we want to, quote unquote, convert those calls mm -hmm. as many as possible into business, right? So if we can change that from 10 out of that 100 to 20 out of the 100, how much more money is that? How many more cases is that, right? And so when we think about an efficient business model, yeah, we want to think about marketing and efficiency, but we want to think about conversions as efficiency. We want to think about staff time as efficiencies, right? So there's a lot of things that we talk about, not because it just feels better, but because when you're dealing with higher volume numbers, you know, small percentages like that make a huge difference. Right. And so it is a crazy expense that you're going to have to have someone on the phone overnight. But the reason is because if you're able to convert more of those cases that you get overnight to real cases that should pay for itself. Right. Mm -hmm. Assuming that you have an efficient business model. I think it's something that every business should strive for because I think deep down they know it's the right answer. Yeah. I mean, if you're not there yet, make that your next goal. Yeah. If it's something that you can do. All right. So moving down the funnel, we've now gotten the phone call, right? We've created this digital experience. We've gotten that phone call. Let's say we've gotten them to agree. They've made the arrangement. They've paid for it. Now it's time to create actual efficiencies within our business, right? Internally. There are certain things that we do a lot differently from an online or just a cremation brand business than you do for a full service business, right? And what are some of the things that you have to make sure you get right 
to make it so that you can justify an $800, $1,000 contract value price. I would say that for both of you, you limited in-person meetings because those probably take much more time than a simple phone call or answering questions online or even preemptively sending emails and notifications and communication out to families so they're not calling in and they're not trying to ask questions about stuff because they already have all the information they would need, right? Mm -hmm. So Will, where would you say you would start when it comes to changing the mindset from a full service type of arrangement to a more efficient, thinking about man hours, right? Staff hours, overhead. Yeah, I think efficient paperwork processing is really big. I think what we offered was what I would call an effortless experience. So when you deal with us, you're going to get the care that you need from my tone of voice when we're on the phone and all of the formalities of the paperwork are going to be seamless. You're going to be able to do it online. I'm going to be able to review it online and tell you that everything's a okay. And if there are any other authorizing parties, they should also be able to do their part online from any device, preferably, and then payment online as well. So I think the online completion of paperwork and payment are the biggest keys to an effortless online cremation experience. Yeah. So paperwork was actually, you know, the number one on my list too, just because I think it can create kind of havoc if it's not right. If it's confusing, it just leads to way more interactions back and forth with that family, way more likelihood of frustrations on both parties' ends, right? Yours and the family's. And having seen like so many different, just call it cremation authorizations at this point, being a party pro and seeing all the different clients that come in, like there is a range, I'm telling you, from a one page, two signature simple to, you know, five to six pages, 25 initials, like there is a massive range. And, and so I think it is worth giving thought and consideration to the simplicity of your paperwork, making sure that it can be easily understood, that it answers the appropriate questions that need to be answered, that it just not, I think of like when a family opens these documents, are they like, what is this that I have to fill out? Or is it more like, okay, this seems straightforward. You know, you want that straightforward feel for everything with the business, especially if you're looking at it as that overall experience for the family. You know, you want that website experience to be simple. You want the arrangement process to be simple. You want the paperwork process to be simple. Not that it can't be lengthy if it has to, but I think there's a lot to be said for using simple language that is easy to understand that the next steps are clear. And when you're trying to be digital, giving some thought to the way that the form will interact digitally versus the way it interacts in person is also worth looking at. Because some of the forms and things don't make as much sense when you put them in, you know, a digital version when you're not explaining things than they do when if your intention is to always to be able to sit down with family and explain this portion, well, you can't really do that anymore. So let's think about how we can clean that up and make it so you don't have to have that extra phone conversation to explain that portion that's not really clear. I think what you said, Ashley, really hammers home the idea that we had earlier about what we need versus what the experience creates, Mm -hmm. right? The one, the cremation authorizations that you're talking about that are five pages and require 25 initials, I'm sure cover every single legal Mm -hmm. base that you need to make sure that if something goes wrong, I am covered 100%, 110%, mm-hmm. and this is ironclad, right? But mm-hmm. at the same time, is there a way that could have been created to achieve the same thing in a much easier mm-hmm. way, right? Like yeah. you know, just sending something over from what your lawyer has created all the way over and saying, okay, you know, I'm not even going to like think about how I could create this better or maybe taking it from your lawyer rewording it or redoing it and then getting it approved and going through multiple iterations to make it much easier. I think there are many advantages to making that easier. And I think on your end too, as someone who's getting that paperwork signed, not having to go through a, I can guarantee you the people that only have to sign two places versus the people that have to sign 25, that's going to generate more phone calls. That's Mm -hmm. going to generate more frustration. That's going to generate less 
business reviews on Google if the experience is so confusing and so tedious that they like don't want to leave you a review, right? So yeah. I think that there are benefits to that that maybe aren't initially seen. Mm-hmm. Because yeah. I can immediately understand the argument where a funeral home could say the family's interacting with it once, you know, it's done. But I think it does lead to the less questions back and forth, less explaining mm-hmm. that your staff has to do, less phone calls, just less confusion overall. And I think that's the key. Yeah. Would you say there were things that you guys did in your respective businesses that were proactive about to eliminate some of the more questions you would get? Were there extra emails you sent out at certain steps? Were there extra phone calls you would make proactively so that families wouldn't have to call you? Were there examples of that, Will? Yeah, I was juggling families and like marketing stuff and shipping cremated remains. So when I had a family that I was counseling, I had to come up with a way that this family felt like they were getting a five-star experience while eliminating as much time for myself as I possibly could. And a lot of that involved just front-loading the conversation. So if the person passed away at like midnight tonight and the next morning I get assigned the case, I'm going to take maybe 20 to 25 minutes to have a conversation with the next of kin tomorrow morning and explain the entire process to them. I'm going to express my condolences. I'm going to tell them that the process includes paperwork and payment. I'm going to send over the paperwork for them and go through it all. And after you go through it all, you can email me with questions or call if you need to. Here are some common questions and common forms that people generally find confusing. They're pages six, seven, and nine. Here are the answers to those questions right here up front for you. And then say, after all this, I'll review the paperwork and automatically send you an invoice online to pay based on the number of death certificates you order, let's say. So that way, basically, I've covered my bases that they don't need a call until maybe after they've completed the paperwork and payment portions, which gives me a lot of my time back. I know that most of the frequently asked questions that they have are already answered. Mm -hmm. So I do that in a very kind way, and give that extra time and extra minutes on the phone, not in person on the front end. And I'm always happy to do that over the phone on the front end because they're not coming in, Mm -hmm. right? So I don't mind giving, you know, an extra 15 minutes on the phone if it saves me an hour long in person arrangement. Mm -hmm. Yeah, makes sense. I think for another one that I could think of too is when people are pre-planning or they've come in and taken care of an at-need arrangement, but the removal hasn't been done yet. I think it's always good practice that Once that removal is complete, you reach out to the family to let them know that the removal has been complete, your loved one's now in our care, just to continue to build that continuity and just so they feel like they are kind of in the loop with the process too. And they've not just signed this document and they're going to hear from you when that cremation is done. And some families will want that and that's okay. But I think just building in those little communication points, we also did that once a family finished their online arrangement and their paperwork, it was just a call to say, we've received this. These are the next steps. This is when you can expect to hear from us next, clarify any questions that they had, clarify anything we needed to clarify and just have that touch point. So again, they're kind of in the loop. And so I think those are good ones to think about too. But yeah, you're right. Being able to spend a little bit of time on the phone, having the family kind of understand the process, it pays off. Even though it's time spent on the phone, it's a payoff because you're not going to have, hopefully have those several calls during them filling out that paperwork or going through the process because you've taken the time to explain it up front. Right. I think you said it really nicely, Ashley, letting them know when they should expect to hear from you next. So you're telling them that you're in it with them Mm -hmm. and you're also controlling the communication as well, Mm -hmm. which is good for you on both fronts. Yeah. Yeah. I think setting proper expectations is really right. important, right? Right. It reduces questions. It reduces back and forth and mm-hmm. it will save you time. It will save frustration. It'll just make a better experience overall. I hate to minimize this to ordering something online, but when you know exactly what day it's going to be, 
when you know the process in which you're at, you know where it is, you know, you see that it's making progress, you don't really have questions, right? Mm -hmm. But if it's something where it's just like, I order something and it's just going to show up when it shows up. I don't have any idea when it's going to happen. There's always a little bit of question. There's always a little bit of frustration there. And I don't think in, in an, an heightened emotional experience, I'm sure that's going to be tenfold, right? Twentyfold, mm -hmm. hundredfold, right? So I think setting proper expectations is something that you really have to do. And it's going to eliminate a ton of back and forth. And it's going to just give everyone the proper expectations. So everyone's on the same page. Yeah. I think of it too as you know, a funeral director, your job is to direct funerals or those, you know, arrangements around funerals. That's kind of what the word means. And when you're literally in person directing a funeral, you are the person that people are looking at for their guidance on where they're going to go. If you're talking, you know, traditional services, at what point is the casket moving? At what point are we going to the cemetery? Like you are directing all of those things. And that's the expectation. The family is looking to you for that direction because they haven't been in that scenario before and they want that direction. It's the same idea with the digital arrangement. You are still directing the arrangement and you need to, to make it an experience versus I now have an online arranger. My families are going to do it. Cremation is going to be done. It's a more proactive piece. You still have to feel like you're directing the arrangement and the family, I think, wants that as well. For the most part, they want to know that somebody's in charge. They want to know that somebody's taking the time to understand the different pieces that need to come together, keep them in the loop about the pieces. Yeah, I just think it's part of directing the arrangement. Yeah. And so I think creating an efficient business model from beginning to end, an efficient mm -hmm. process is, is important. But I think that when we think about it, and this is what I'm always going to say is the most important because all the other stuff kind of falls in line if you are in this, but it's really just having like the all in mindset that yeah. you want to build an online yeah. affordable cremation. Yeah, that's a good point. Well, I had a consulting client that has an existing funeral home and then is starting a cremation brand. And one of the things that I noticed is it's extremely difficult to have an existing funeral home brand and be all in on a online cremation brand. I kind of see in the staff, the staff is trained to upsell for funeral service and make sure that they go to final placement at the cemetery when their cremation brand clients should have a completely different experience and the mm -hmm. sales tactics used with them should be completely different and a lot more hands-off in my view. So it just made me think about the success of those types of businesses that are trying to capture cremation volume with a subsidiary of their funeral home rather than actually mm -hmm. believing that it's like the end all be all growth option for their business. Mm -hmm. Right. I don't know if you have any comments on that, but I just I think that what we've seen is the most successful customers that are full service operators and have a cremation brand is they have dedicated staff yeah. that are yeah, usually yeah, yeah. dedicated to the online brand versus the, you know, obviously they'll help out. They'll make adjustments when needed, but for the most part, this manager is managing this brand. This manager is managing that brand. They obviously share resources. They share mm -hmm. the crematory. They share stuff like that. But for the most part, there is a way to do business and a manager here. And there's a way to do business and a manager here, right? Yeah. Mm -hmm. And I think that's what we've seen be successful. When you have the types where it's, you know, oh, we have this brand, but it's the same exact people. It just doesn't right. work. Yeah. 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 If I were to start a cremation brand, I think that my mantra would be basically that I want as many direct cremation families as I can sustainably handle at the price I've yep. advertised. Right. I right. want as many, like I want unlimited. Yeah. yeah. At five starting. Yeah. Yeah. It's I want as many of those as I can. Not like yeah. I only want some that aren't going to go to my competitors. No, it's like I right. want to dominate this market. Right. You don't necessarily have to have those plans to for world domination, but <laughs> the mindset that you have to have when going and approaching a family needs to be like that. Mm -hmm. I want this family and I'm okay. And I'm happy more yes. than happy yes. to serve them at the price that I have advertised. Mm -hmm. I don't feel like I'm missing out on something. If I don't upsell them onto witness and a, a burial or whatever, like I have to be happy with what the service I'm providing is. 
And I just want as many of those as possible. If I get a thousand of them tomorrow and I can actually serve that thousand, mm-hmm. I'm more than happy with that. Right. Yeah. I think mm-hmm. yeah, all too often we see the defensive mode of like, I don't want my competitors to have this. We're losing them to our yeah. competitors. So I'm going to start this brand to combat that. But it's really at the detriment to the team that's trying to execute this on your behalf. It's like you're pulling that your brands are talking at a different sides of the same mouth. Mm-hmm. And the people meant to actually serve these families like are confused about what tactics they should use because you're double dipping. Mm-hmm. And inevitably, you're going to get upset because they didn't handle something that you would have handled differently. And they said, well, I'm getting pulled in two different directions here and trying to like, you're trying to have your cake and eat it too. So mm-hmm. Tyler, what you said is know who you're serving and know who you're not serving and make sure that that's clear to your team. They're going all in on what you do do and that you're out of what you don't do. Yeah. Mm-hmm. That's it, right? For sure. We're going to be five-star experiences for direct cremation families is what we do. Then that's what you do. Mm -hmm. Yeah. I have a question for you, Will and and Ashley. When you guys were at your cremation brands, was it ever a push to try to include more and more services every time? Or was it more about refining what you had? It's interesting because I'd say my goal was to mitigate services and COVID actually helped me accomplish that and covid forcing us into that paradigm shift it actually proved my thesis that i had prior to covid which was you'd get the same or more families at the same level of experience five star experience with a narrower service focus i think i was always fighting against my team members who were like, Hey, I had a family that wanted a lock of hair. They wanted handprints in clay or thumbprints on this. And they want to do whatever the family wants them to do, which is not what I, as a business person really want to do at all. So it's kind of a push and pull between like, what should you be adding? And how do you actually create a scorecard around what gets put into that Overton window of what you serve and what you don't serve. I would have preferred to minimize products and services even more than we did. And some people would say that that's wrong or bad for families. But I would just respond by saying, I choose how we serve families. And if families don't respond to that, then I'll fail as a business. Mm -hmm. That's true. Yeah, for me, it was more so we were still a full service funeral home, even though primarily Mm -hmm. we did direct cremations, we were still full service. So we were still, you know, doing traditional funerals here and there, we were still doing, you know, a good number of graveside funerals. Yeah. However, what we started to see was that our staff got really, really good at direct cremations, because that we were doing primarily. And with newer graduates from the program never having done a traditional funeral it got more and more challenging to actually have staff have that know-how and have the right skills to do that because we didn't do them frequently enough where it was our main business so we weren't able to you know train them on a whole lot of traditional funerals so we did get to the point where it was like we're going to need to segment things we're going to have to have staff that really does cremations and then we're going to have to have some staff that's going to meet with our traditional clients so it does become a challenge at some point i also am with will i don't know that had we said you know what we're only going to do cremations that it like what impact that would have had i think it would have helped the staff be a little bit more efficient because there's just kind of no question they can kind of hone in on that skill set even more so and not have to juggle you know a traditional funeral at the same time which is just a different animal, so to speak. You know, there's way more details yeah. involved, way more touch points, churches to call, cemeteries to call, things yeah. to do. It's just, it requires far more attention than an online direct cremation case. So yeah, I think that honing in on what you are going to offer is a great idea. And I don't yeah. know that it has massive impact, or at least I don't think it would have at Crown and Sounds like Will doesn't think maybe it would have at Omega either. I think the all-in mindset on what you offer and talking about it every day with your team will just 
build the culture you want to see out of your team Mm -hmm. and you're going to get the best out of them by just saying, Mm -hmm. Hey, this is what we do. And explain to them why what you do is valuable. Like we Mm -hmm. offer five-star experiences with tremendous amount of empathy and compassion at $1,100. Mm-hmm. You should feel good about coming into the office and providing a cremation for half of the price of the national average so that mm-hmm. you know that every family you serve, you're not breaking them and they're not going into debt trying to pay for end-of-life arrangements. You know, yeah. And that's something that a normal, empathetic, and compassionate person will find rewarding. Mm-hmm. You know? And you're just not saying, hey, your purpose and your value is selling this many urns, getting Mm -hmm. this much commission, or getting this type of family to choose this type of service. Communicate the value proposition and why what you're doing and what you're offering at that price is valuable to the people you're serving. And if it's valuable to 5,000 people, you know, that should tell you something about people's preferences, Mm -hmm. right? There's a few fun facts. This is a little off the path, but as we come to the end, I thought there was some sure. fun stuff in there. Tesla has what? Four models, I think now. Yeah. And that ugly truck that they are launching. But Launch. they sell 1.2% of all new cars yeah. are Teslas now. Yeah. So I think if they had tried to come out with a full fleet of cars to compete with every single car manufacturer, they wouldn't be able to do it, right? But they've been able to reduce their offerings Mm-hmm. and really focus on what they do and get the costs down so that you're able to get an electric car for much cheaper than you would have been able to, right? Had they had a full fleet. Even further to your point, Tyler, they've done it without putting a single commercial on TV. Yeah. Also, <laughs> here's another one. in and out You guys like in and out Yes. They sell over $500 million in burgers and fries every year. But they have like three items on their menu. So they have burgers, mm-hmm. they have fries, and they have shakes right? Like those are the only three things they do. They do it really well. I think that we come sometimes with the fear that if we specialize too much, we're missing out. But if you're able to really provide value to those that I think the stat now is like 30% of all deaths are direct cremations now or something like that. It's growing. I think that specializing is not necessarily a bad thing or something that you need to be scared of. It's just you need to make sure that whatever you do, you do it really well, right? Mm -hmm. And that there can be success found making sure that you do what you do really well. And being happy with the results of that. One of the things that I think if you're a direct cremation brand, you know, you're trying to do everything online and the minimal amount in person, which is good. If there's one thing that I think a lot of folks can spend the time on and really make a valuable experience for folks is the process of getting remains returned to the family. That in-person process as a capstone to their entire experience. If they're coming to your office to retrieve the urn, there are ways to make them feel special in that 15 minute or 20 minute process that really is like a cherry on top of that whole thing that gives them that personal connection as a final piece de resistance to the whole thing. And so you can think deeply about that in your respective business. And I think there's there's Mm -hmm. a lot of things to do there. So I think, again, it's like not making it so transactional. I think that speaks to that. Right. Just a little, little touch here. There goes a long way. I exactly. Think. Actually, I can tell just if you give that any process, just a little bit of thought, mm-hmm. usually within about 10 to 20 minutes of brainstorming, you can come mm-hmm. up with some really good ideas of just mm-hmm. setting that value so mm-hmm. much higher than what it currently is. A lot of the time folks don't even do that, unfortunately. No. But those are the things that get remembered, right? Those are the things that get put in a review. Those are the things that somebody tells somebody else that these are the reasons why that hospice company keeps coming back to you because they've had that personal experience and they feel good about that. So these are the things that end up setting people apart from their competitors along the way. Yeah. And I think that's why I think that the all in mindset is important here. Is yeah. because as long as you have that mindset, you will iterate, you will make changes, you will look at it, you will try to improve your processes. Even if your mm-hmm. process is not as efficient, you're going to look for those processes because you're going to have that mindset to grow this brand, right? When this mm-hmm. brand is not forefront of your business and you're not looking to grow and you're not focusing on it, it just gets put to the wayside. Mm-hmm. So I think that's why I say that the all-in mindset is the most important thing. And as long as you have that, you will figure out the other stuff. 
Mm-hmm. Cool. So is there anything else that you think we missed in starting a brand? Obviously, we talked very high level on a lot of these things, a lot of nuances and specific things I think will matter depending on your location and your brand and your clientele. But is there anything else that you think we missed, Will or Ashley? No, oh, that's pretty, pretty comprehensive. Mm-hmm. Yeah, not that comes to mind immediately anyways. All right. Well... Ashley and Willow, when are you going to start your own cremation brands? I'm just kidding. (laughs) 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 Thank you, everyone, for listening. As always, we appreciate you all. Thank you, Ashley and Will, for giving your insights. I think that if you were to follow most of these, you're going to be 50% good on your way to doing it. Obviously, there's going to be all that other stuff of actually doing the Mm -hmm. work itself. But I think these are good steps to make sure that you cover before you either start or even you can audit your current business and go through these. And I guarantee you, you'll find some places where you can improve on. Mm-hmm. So yeah, thank you for the Direct Commission Podcast. I'm Tyler Yamasaki with Will DeMichaelis and Ashley Jones. Thank you. Bye. Bye. Thank you so much for listening. If you've enjoyed this episode, please leave us a review on Spotify or Apple Podcasts. If you ever want to know more, please find us at directcremation.com. 